Good evening. It is great to have everybody here tonight on this beautiful evening. Good to have all of you watching online. We'll uh, share these uh, updates with you before we continue our worship. Uh, all prime timers and others who have signed up to be a dashboard driver, uh, please be picking up your, ta uh, your packet from the table in the south hallway. Uh, keep in mind that this continues to be a fifth Sunday and uh, all excess contributions uh, really tonight through Tuesday uh, will go through and go toward a travel expense fund. This will uh, ensure that all members who wish to travel to our domestic mission points are able to do so. Dorcas Sewing Ministry uh, will be meeting uh, Tuesday from 10 till noon. Our Wednesday night fellowship meal will be f Wednesday at 545. Be signing up tonight by tonight uh, online or in the cabinets. As Mike announced this morning, we'll be having our movie night at 6 o'clock on Saturday. Adults will be down in the fellowship room and the children will be down in the multi-purpose room. Uh, the spring food drive for Tennessee Children's Home continues. Please be make, bringing your items to the bins and the hallways through next Sunday. And then next Sunday night, we'll be having a fellowship meal for everyone after the evening service. There'll be some surprise recognitions made during the dinner, so hope you'll be planning to attend. Also next Sunday afternoon, the bridal shower for Kaylin Garten and Brian Rivera. They are registered at thenut.com. As we announced this morning, uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, on, we'll begin our uh, second Sunday night of the month. We'll be featuring a devotional followed by a variety of service opportunities. Uh, we'll be moving our card writing ministry, Monday Night for the Master, to this Sunday night of the month. Uh, opportunities to help with the pantry. You know, we have had dozens and dozens of connections in the community with backpack giveaway and trunk or treat and Christmas with Santa. Uh, so this evening uh, can give us a chance to maybe prepare some gift baskets, some care baskets, and maybe even going out and visit some guests, some, some community members. So we look forward to uh, the su second Sunday night of the month opportunities for worship and service. Tim. One other update, next Sunday night, we will have singing night. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know about that. I've been getting a lot of questions on when are we gonna have a singing night again? So next Sunday night, it'll be here in the auditorium. So we'll be asking everybody to move up front. So you'll hear me say that two or three times, but we'll look forward to that night of singing. Guys, any of you that want to lead, I'd love for you to participate. We'll uh, have a board of, of uh, favorites and requests. So we'll have that in the back. And we'll move that up to the front and we can pick off of that board or just leave anything that you want to. Let's begin our worship this evening. We'll start with I Stand Amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Oh. 
scripture reading this evening comes from Luke chapter 24 verses 6 and 7. It says, He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here together and to glorify your name, and we ask that you'll allow us to keep in our hearts the meaning behind the holiday that we celebrate today and to remember that Easter is not just a time to collect eggs during an egg hunt or to eat meals with our family, but to remember the reason behind it and the resurrection that your son had. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have in this great country in which we live to meet here together without the fear of persecution or for being looked upon differently for the things that we believe. And we ask that you'll allow as we go back into school or into work during the week that you'll allow us to share our faith with others and to be confident in doing so, so that we can continue to further your kingdom. 
And we thank you for your son and his sacrifice and the ability he had to be resurrected so that we can do the same. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. be seated. You 
You can now find these at grocery stores, typically they're the checkout aisle so the kids can beg their parents for one of these snacks before they head off along the way. They say Kinder Egg on them, not the uh, German stuff that's up there, whatever might be up there now. But I was, the first time I saw that I was 12 years old, I was traveling to Germany. I was working at a military base with teenagers there. And as part of our day, we had some morning classes, we had some free time, and a couple of teens that were there who were stationed at the military base, uh, we went off the site to some various tourist attractions, and we went to one of the local candy shops, and they told me I had to try one of these eggs. Now today, the eggs are very much built in a safe container, like you have like a, you open it up, and you open one side is the chocolate, and the other side is the toy that you get as part of your kinder experience. My first time in Germany, you take a bite of this, and in the middle of it is actually a plastic toy wrapped up. So you don't know that there's a plastic toy. You have a choking hazard. We're more concerned about that in America than they were in Germany. America, we simply set them apart. In Germany, it was good luck kids with this particular chocolate that you have. And you'd bite it open, and all you would get was just sort of a yellow thing in the middle, and you'd pop it open. You had to put together whatever toy that was. It was your surprise as part of your chocolate candy that you had. It's funny that Emmett now, every time we go there and he sees it, always asks for one. And I typically, I give in because it's kind of a neat thing to share between my childhood and his, these kinder eggs. As you go out there and you grab it and you see what your surprise toy is, you, you put it together and it gives you kind of this chocolate at the beginning, but also a surprise at the end. You know, I was thinking about the resurrection of Jesus. And there's some main things that we talk about quite a bit when it comes to resurrection. There are things like this morning we talk about. We discuss eternal life, justification, salvation, redemption. Some of those things that we know come along with the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. But there are some things I like to call surprises. Meaning some things that maybe we don't think about near enough that come as simply surprises or extras that come along with the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. When you buy a Kinder Egg, you're buying it for the chocolate, supposedly. You're buying it for that, that taste there. And the toy is just the extra that goes along with it. I guess similar to a Happy Meal, you're supposed to be buying the food and the toy there at the end. It's just that extra little thing that comes along with the main thing you're getting at the beginning. There's a lot of things that come along with the resurrection, but there are also some things that sometimes we, or oftentimes, we sort of forget about. Some blessings that if they stood alone would be quite amazing, but we forget about them because God has done so much for us. In fact, there's so much of Scripture laying out all the wonderful ways that God has blessed us that we forget about things that God does for us on a regular basis. So we're going to talk tonight about three surprises, three things that are not the, the main thing, they're not the, the thing that maybe we get the most insight, but three things that are still unbelievably important and really, really amazing that God surprises us with because Jesus was raised from the dead. The first one simply being this, that God is always with us. You know, it's interesting, if you go back to the very formation of creation, when God lays out and says, I'm going to create humanity, and I'm going to be their God, and he's going to be my people, we've had this basic covenant with God, that God would be with us, that God would be there alongside us, whether it's the Garden of Eden, a place where God created so that man and God could coexist, so we could have this relationship with God, whether it was the paradise that we see as uh, Eden, or later on as you jump further along and you get into the land of Canaan, you have God being with his people, a promise there, as he gave Moses that I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell amongst you. It was seen the tabernacle, the temple, the carrying around the presence of God at day and night, showing them that God was in their midst. When Matthew's declaring that God is coming amongst his people to save us, he quotes the story from Isaiah. And he talks about God being with us. That will be his name, reminding us of this awesome presence of God. In the Gospel of John, you have Jesus talking with his disciples, reminding them of the fact that he was going to go away for a little while, but he would still be with them. And the disciples had to be shocked to figure out what exactly does that mean? You're, you're going away for a while, then you'll be back with me and you'll not separate from me. What does this mean exactly? It wasn't until the resurrection of Jesus they recognized the fact that his going away was his brief time in the grave. And once he was raised from the dead, he is with us always. Matthew 28 ends with those words, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this very age. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, whenever Paul is laying out the numerous blessings we have in Christ, at the forefront takes those things like the fact that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, we have this relationship with God, we have reconciliation, we have hope beyond the grave. All those things are in there, but Paul makes sure at the end of his long sentence that he reminds the fact that we have the Spirit of God who's been given to us. That God is with us in this powerful way, even today, that God is on our side. You know, Paul, when he's in, nearing the end of his life and he's facing various trials, not the kind we talk about, but literally standing before various Roman magistrates to plead his case, talks about how many of the folks that were with him had uh, in some way abandoned him. He mentions two folks by names who had abandoned him, but yet he says, I was not alone because Christ stood there with me. He understood that God was with him throughout the process. You know, one of the promises of the resurrection is the fact that Jesus is not dead. He's not a, a God who was. He's not a God who used to be. He's not a God who dwelled back then. But he's a God who is now alive and with us at all times. He's still our high priest in heaven. The Hebrew writer trying to talk about the active nature of God and how Jesus is still on our side talks about we have a high priest who understands us, who gets us, and who pleads our case even today, reminding us that God is with us even after the death of Jesus. That Jesus, who was fully man and continues to be man even to this day, is there at the right hand of the Father, and God is still on our side, and God's with us. And not just that, his resurrection eventually poured out the Spirit on us to have God with us in this new and unique way. You think about the beautiful things that God does for us, isn't it great to know that God is with us? That God is on our side, that he's there beside us, that the promise of Jesus coming into this world that was quoted from Isaiah into Matthew is not a promise of a, a brief period of time. It wasn't that God was with us for 30 years, maybe 33 years, and then God disappeared once again. It's that God is, was with us then and God is still with us even today. After his resurrection appearance, when Jesus tells his disciples about their mission to go and preach the gospel, he leaves them with those words. And lo, I'll be with you always. It's an amazing thing to think about. God is on our side and with us, and nothing can separate us from this relationship with God. In the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul begins to play this sort of a mind game with his readers about, can you, can you think for a moment what might keep you and God separated? And Paul lists quite a few things, uh, whether it's death or famine or disease or this thing or that thing. In the end, Paul says, none of those things can separate us from God. Yeah, maybe it's not the main thing you think about when you think about the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. But one of the promises we have is that Jesus is raised from the dead and therefore he is always with us. We have a second promise that's like that though. One that maybe sometimes we put on the back burner, we don't think about it as the very first thing when it comes to what God has done for us. But a promise nonetheless regarding what God gives us even after his resurrection. And that promise is made in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark as well, that we have a new family. You've heard it expressed this way, a, a new people of God from every nation, tongue, and tribe. This morning we talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 that God was reconciling us to him, dividing the enmity, the hatred, and us to one another. In chapter 3 of that same book, Paul says that the great mystery of God was revealed to us. That God had this mystery that one day he would unite every people under one group, under one body. And it wouldn't just simply be this group's the people of God or that group's the people of God. But all those who submit to Jesus are now becoming the people of God. You'll write in the book of Galatians, it was Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian. All these backgrounds could now be one new thing. And in chapter 3 of Ephesians, he says the great mystery is that God revealed through us that through Jesus, every one of us are a part of a new family of God. We're called brothers and sisters, and Jesus is called our older brother, and God is called our father. In the Gospel of Luke, whenever Jesus is approaching a group of folks, they say, or whenever Jesus' family is approaching him, they say, look, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus says, no, no, my family are those who do the will of my father, reminding us that God was creating something new. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, there the disciples are asking Jesus about everything that they gave up. Lord, we have given up farms and houses and family and brothers and all these things for you. Uh, 
If you think about the immense sacrifice of those early disciples, the one who left behind their old way of doing things, who denied old gods, who said yes to Jesus, who many thought was a blasphemer, who dedicated their life to them, they lost everything. They were booted from their social structure, from their synagogue. They lost family. In fact, Jesus said that at times he came and brought a sword of division between mother and child and father and son because of the nature of accepting Jesus would push you aside. The world persecuted Christ, they'll persecute you. They rejected Jesus, they'll reject you as well. So the disciples who appear to be somewhat worried about what exactly does it mean, whether or not it's worth it or not, ask the question, Lord, if we've given all these things up, what is the end result for us? And Jesus says, you'll be given a hundredfold, houses, families, brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. We forget this sometime, but the resurrection of Jesus creates within us a new family of God. I have the privilege of, of traveling, and oftentimes when I travel, one of two things, I'm traveling for the purpose of preaching and teaching somewhere, or I'm traveling for work, and I love to go meet folks who are Christians in other places. And it's amazing how you immediately are accepted as, as a brother, that they recognize you, they want to talk with you, no matter where you are in the world. Travel to foreign countries and worship services where I don't quite know their language and they don't quite know my language, but we have a common song that we sing and that the words are similar and we have a common time around the table and maybe I've got somebody transiting in my ear what's being said and we have these situations in which people I would never have any contact with for any reason whatsoever invite me in as family in that way. Because we have gained houses, families, brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. We have gained something far more. The church is the family of God, the household of God, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And that church is seen in a local congregation like Woodson Chapel, where all of a sudden we become a new family of God, leaning upon each other, helping one another, being there for one another, encouraging one another. But then in God's wisdom, this family is multiplied throughout locations and places and languages all over the world. And all of a sudden we have family extended everywhere. You know, early on the last probably 15 years, a man and I were in Nashville, we'd travel places to go see our family. And so you'd have these road trips or flights back west or back north to go see various family members. It's different now. Her parents have moved closer and my parents moved closer. So it's not as quiet as an adventure. But before there was this idea of we're going somewhere. But when we get there, we're going to be with family. Spread out all across the U.S. And more so than that, the church is a family spread all across the world. And a family that has relatives and ancestors of faith that go back farther than we can imagine. And will continue until this world comes to an end. There's this new family of God. When we think about the resurrection of Jesus, we think about salvation, forgiveness. We think about things such as the, uh, the redemption he provides. We think about justification, the hope that's there. But part of that hope and, th and of all that stuff there is that God is with us. That we have a new family of God that we're connected to. And every time someone turns their life over to Jesus in the waters of baptism, they become our brother and sister. And all of a sudden they get this extended family. There's a final surprise that to me has always been maybe the coolest statements in Scripture. And maybe it's not one of the surprise to you, but it is to me when I think about it in terms of this grand scheme of all things. And it's found in the book of Hebrews, whenever God's describing the new covenant that God makes with us. And to set things up, a Hebrew writer lays it out and says, when you think about sin under the Old Testament, you think about a system that always made you aware that you were a sinner. Every time you sinned or when you sinned, a sacrifice was required. Each year, a grand gathering of all those who gathered were taken together. And a sacrifice was required at that moment in time to remind you of the sinfulness of the nature. The high priest had to offer a sacrifice in his, on his sinfulness. You were always reminded of sin. I sometimes tell folks we have those clean pictures of the temple, right? Where the altar of sacrifice is just like it's been disinfected with Lysol. That's not how it would look in their day. You'd have a butcher shop almost with blood and all the things that are there. And a reminder in a very real sense of what sin caused. And the Hebrew writer said under that old system of having to sacrifice bulls and goats, you were always reminded of your sin. 
It was always in front of you. You never could quite get over the guilt because it was always there. And he compares that with the beauty of what God has done for us through the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus means that there is a one-time sacrifice good for all time. I don't go back under and crucify him again. I don't go find an animal to, to, to kill on my behalf. That one-time good for all time sacrifice means that I can no longer have to live in guilt. And that's because not only do I not have to remember my sins anymore, but the promise in Hebrews is God has amnesia towards your sins. I will remember your sins no more as a promise of this new covenant. That I will no longer recognize those things or hold it against you. And to my mind, when I was a, a little kid when I first heard this verse and first heard this, understood this, it was amazing to me that God could forget the bad things that I've done. And some of you who are older might sometimes wonder the same thing because you have difficulty forgetting the bad things you've done. And you wonder, can God do the same? But I'm telling you now, the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus means that God remembers your sins no more. And what's beautiful is God continues to remember your good deeds. He has selective memory. He remembers all the good things you've done and never remembers any of the bad things. It's almost the grandparent syndrome. When you have the grandparents watch the kids, you ask them how did things go, they always talk about how good they were, but nothing bad ever happened at grandma's house. And having once been a grandchild and still a grandchild, I know plenty of things happen bad at grandma's house that grandma has a way of covering those up once parents come along. And I say that God works in this particular scenario. A God that remembers all of our good things and forgets everything that we've done wrong. A God who remembers our sins no more, not just in the moment of time when we're saved, but continues to do that. And from the book of 1 John, the blood of Christ continues to wash away your sins. You know, there are a lot of things you can talk about when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus. You could have Bible class for 13 weeks. You could write 27 or so books that we call the New Testament that all center on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And we still would not have everything we wish we would could know about it. You can talk about on a Sunday morning the, the power of the resurrection, the purpose of it, the promise of it. You can get into that and talk about redemption, forgiveness, eternal life, and the hope that we have. But you also have these little surprises that go a little further. Outside the main thing of the chocolate, you have these little surprises on the inside that remind us of just how good God is to us. That God is with us no matter what. That God gives us a new family. And that God remembers our sins no more. So when you walk down Kroger and your kid's asking you for a Kinder Egg or one of these things here, or a, a toy or a Happy Meal, remember this message. That sometimes those surprises end up being the special thing about life. And sometimes those surprises that God gives us are the things that give us hope in the midst of life. There have been times in your life where you need it more maybe than knowing that God forgives you. You needed someone to talk to and God gave you a family. There are times you felt completely depressed and with no one there, you need to be known that Jesus had not forsaken or abandoned you. And there are times in your life when you're in despair over your sin, you need to know that God has forgiven you and no longer remembers those things. And that's one of the beauties of all these surprises that God grants his people. Yes, the chocolate might be why you buy a Kinder Egg, but the surprise adds even more cool stuff to it. And our God continues to surprise us with his goodness and greatness. And tonight, if you've not yet become a child of God, you can be surprised by a God who forgives you and redeems you and gives you a new family. And we want to help you to do that. If you're not yet become a Christian, we'd love to help you make that decision to be baptized into Christ. And if you need the help of the family that God has given you, now is a great time to make that known. And let us help you as together we stand and as we sing.
Again, it's great to have everyone with us tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're just honored with your presence tonight. Thank you for being with us as we come on this beautiful Easter Sunday to worship and praise our God together. Those of you who have joined us online, thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, we have enjoyed worshiping with you as well. We'll remind everyone we do have the Wednesday night dinner. So if you haven't signed up, tonight's the sign up to do that. You can do it in the cabinet or you can do it online. So we hope as many will come for that fellowship as possible. We'll see you again Wednesday at 5 and at 7 for our Bible study time. This time, if you haven't had a chance to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, you can pick up some emblems as you're following the hallway uh, down to my right to the fireside room. Steve Green will be there to serve you at this time. Before we close, let's sing a couple of verses of Mansions Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied just because the Lord, a Father, we come to you so thankful for all the many blessings you've given to us. We're thankful for another beautiful day on your earth and another opportunity to gather here tonight and study your word. Thank you for Wesley and the lesson he gave to us. Help us to focus in on today and every day about the resurrection and that the opportunity it gives us at eternal life with you. Help us to block out the distractions and keep our hearts focused on you, Lord. Know that at this time many people are suffering, Lord, so we ask that you ease their pain and bring them comfort like only you can. As we go out into the world this week, please help us be a light to those around us and be a light to you, Lord, and help bring people to you. Thank you for all that you do and thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>